Step into the world of medical school admissions with our guest today, Senior Director of Admissions and Financial Aid at Case Western Reserve University Medical School. Discover the unique aspects of the three MD programs, the significance of research and the application process at Case Western, and what makes an applicant get accepted. Welcome to Admission Straight Talk, the podcast dedicated to graduate admissions and helping you approach the application process thoughtfully and successfully. Your host is Accepted's founder and world-renowned admissions guru, Linda Abraham. At Accepted, our mission is to get you to that unforgettable moment when you read your acceptance email and shout, yes, I'm in, confident you'll be attending the perfect program to help you launch the career of your dreams. Thanks for tuning in to this, our 571st episode of Admission Straight Talk. Are you ready to apply to your dream medical schools? Are you competitive at your target programs? Acceptance Med School Admissions Quiz can give you a quick reality check. Just go to accepted.com slash med quiz, complete the quiz, and you'll not only get an assessment, but tips on how to improve your chances of acceptance. Plus, it's all free. Again, take the quiz at accepted.com slash med quiz to obtain your free assessment. I'm delighted to introduce today's guest, Christian Esman, Senior Director of Admissions and Financial Aid and fellow podcaster and host of the All Access Med School Admissions Podcast. Christian, thank you so much for joining me today on Admissions Straight Talk. Hi, Linda. Delighted to be here. Thank you for having me. My pleasure. Let's start with uh, some just really basic information about Case Western University's medical school's programs. Can you give a 30,000-foot perspective or view of the different programs, the three MD programs that it offers. Certainly. Yeah, we're a bit unique in that we have not one, not two, but three uh, different pathways to an MD and slash MD PhD. And so first one is the university program, which is our four-year MD, and that's a traditional four-year degree. Then we have our MD PhD program, medical scientist training program, and that's about eight or nine years. And they actually, MSTP actually started at Case Western back in the 1950s, by the way. Really? So it's the longest funded NIH funded program ever in the world history of the universe. And then the one in the middle is kind of unique. Um, I don't know if the word boutique is a word, but it's kind of boutique. Okay. Um, Our Cleveland Clinic Learner College of Medicine. So these are all three Case Western programs. They're all under the umbrella of the university and they're all Case Western students, but we have three tracks. So the one in the middle, the Cleveland Clinic Learner College of Medicine is a five-year MD, and it's for students who really like research, really, really, really like research, but maybe advancing to an MD, PhD is not an educational goal to get be in school for eight or nine years and getting a PhD, but they really like research. And so the reason why it's five years is because they thread research throughout the entire five years that you're there. And at one point, students will step away, usually after the second year, to do 12 months of research mm-hmm. with the results of hopefully having some publishable you know, results. And so it's for students who might be considering MD-PhD. Maybe they're also applying to MD-PhD. But so it's kind of one in the middle there. And so that's why we have three different tracks. It's a bit unique. It is unique. I, I I don't know of any other school that has that three mm-hmm. structured program. Uh, yeah. So offering. if I can add, when people yeah. apply to us mm-hmm. in AMCAS, they apply to Case Western. And then in our secondary application, they can indicate which program or programs, plural, that they want to apply to. And so you could apply to the university program and the Cleveland Clinic program. And then you get separate uh, decision, admissions decisions, where we review them separately. So it's kind of two for one or three for one, if you want to think of it that way. But I will say this, very few students apply to all three. Usually if you're interested in MD, PhD, that's what you're applying to. And then maybe add in Cleveland Clinic, but very few students apply to, applicants apply to all three. That makes so, sense. Yeah. Then I think if they did attempt to apply to the, all three, you'd kind of be a little... Like yeah, what sometimes really we can, yeah, we don't know what to yeah. do with you. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> so, right, right. But we evaluate them everybody separately, so it's not like I don't call to my colleagues down the hallway and say, "Hey, Cleveland Clinic friends, what are you guys doing with this applicant?" We don't have those kind of conversations. Right. So it, it's possible to get interviews at two programs and then be accepted to both, and then you decide, or you get to be yeah. interviewed at one and not the other, or interview or interview at both and be accepted and waitlisted at the other. So it's all kinds of permutations that can happen after that. Got it. 
Let's dive into the biggest program, the four-year MD program. Can you provide an overview of that program, focusing on its more distinctive elements? How is it structured? What is the focus, mm -hmm. et cetera? Yeah, so the university program is our largest program. The class size is 170. And a couple of the cornerstones of this program would be a lot of small group team-based learning, problem-based learning. That in the first two years, that is probably what might be considered the main vehicle for medical education delivery in the first two years. When I talked to, we talked to, Students, when they matriculate, we do some like fun little focus groups with first years after they come here and sit down with them and ask them things about their 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 interview process that they went through the year prior. And oftentimes those new first years will tell us one thing that stuck out about this university program is that you guys say you do small group learning and you mean it like it's <laughs> three, sometimes four days a week for two years, whereas some other schools, oh, yeah, we do small group learning, but it's like once every six weeks. <laughs> and so that was for students that like to work in small group, intimate, collaborative learning environments. This is uh, something really to think about very carefully eh, because that's where a majority of the learning takes place. There are lectures that occur afterward, kind of framing bigger picture topics, but really the main vehicle where students really roll up their sleeves and get into the material and learn how to unpack the basic sciences with the clinical sciences, that's where it happens. Another cornerstone of the university program would be the research piece. All I mentioned a few moments ago, we have three tracks. All three tracks have research embedded within it. The difference is the intensity level. So I mentioned the Cleveland Clinic program has like a 12-month research focus. The right. PhD clearly has a PhD embedded within it. The university program has a scholarly project, or we call it a thesis, but it's not a master's level thesis. It's secretly in our office. I'm going to let the secret out. We call it a diet thesis or a, okay. thesis, a, a thesis light, <laughs> if you will. So it's experiential research that every, every student gets involved in. So they choose a project. It's a mentored thesis. And so they can kind of dip their toe into what medical research can look like. It's not about churning out physician and scientists out of the university program. We have two other programs that that's their, that's their philosophy. This is about exposing all of our students to medical research. So they gain appreciation for the time and effort and sometimes the blood, sweat, and tears that goes into one manuscript because we know that after they leave here, they're going to be getting journals for the rest of their lives. And to have an appreciation for the inquiry that goes into one manuscript and learn how to critically analyze articles and do literature reviews is, is the purpose of that. Now, some students will sink their teeth into it a little bit more than others, but that's what everybody will have. And at the end of the day, everybody will have research on their resume, AKA their residency application. So that's another kind of glow that might come out of that as well. Um, and I think the last pillar would be innovation. We're a university that prides itself on kind of not being afraid to try new technology. And one of the features of our university program is how we incorporate Microsoft HoloLens into our anatomy program. Uh, we're the first university partner with Microsoft to build hollow anatomy, and it's using the HoloLens goggles to uh, complement our anatomy program. And so they do hollow anatomy uh, usually two days a week for two years. We do cadaveric dissection early on in their, their first year for two weeks, so really we call it dissection boot camp. But after that, we incorporate hollow anatomy after that. And so they build on what they saw in dissection and using Microsoft Hollow and it's amazing technology. Is it um, so it's, it's basically it's, a form of simulation? Yeah, it's uh, augmented reality. So there's virtual reality is where I had to learn this stuff. Virtual reality is where you, you put the goggles on, you can't see anything. So you're immersed into an environment virtually. Augmented reality is these look like big sunglasses. Yeah. So I can see, we can all see each other, but in front of us is a hologram of a humerus of a thorax of a, you know entire person whatever they want us to focus in on and so it's they you can stay walk around it stick your head in it move it it, it, it works with like you move in and out of it it's pretty amazing stuff so we're the first Sounds school to to implement that and build it and now other institutions across the country are using hollow anatomy like the northwestern is using it tcu down in texas um, Oxford University over in London or in England. Um, and I, I, Linda, I, I'll tell you, I think in the next five or 10 years, you're going to see more, more med schools incorporating VR, AR 
into their curricula. I know Kaiser Permanente has their own thing that they have incorporated into their curricula. So Mm -hmm. I think we're going to see more schools kind of, but that's the thing in academia. Things can sometimes move slowly. And so we're But then they catch on. Yeah. But but we're not one of those schools that kind of wait sometimes. So we, this is a a very kind of tech, techie kind of place too sometimes. Early adapter. Yeah, I guess. Yeah. 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 Well, one thing I think you've innovated, I don't know if you're the, the first, but certainly uh, somewhat uncommon, is that you have a stated MCAT cutoff. Mm-hmm. It's a fairly low cutoff, but mm-hmm. it's a stated cutoff. Why have you chosen to provide it? Again, I don't think you're unique in that, but right. it is fairly uncommon. Yeah, I talked to a couple of my friends at other med schools that have um, published cutoffs. And one of the reasons why, Linda, was because in the in the application pool, we sometimes see people that have metrics that are not going to be viable as a candidate to our medical school. They're, it's just not going to get through admissions committee. Mm-hmm. And one of those metrics that we looked at very closely was the MCAT. And so 23-24 was the first year that we implemented this. So let's start kind of low and um, see how it goes. And we might bump it up again this year, taking, taking a closer look at it at, at, through the data um, as we wrap up this cycle, but it, it really, Linda, it kind of came down to, and this is probably not the best phrase, but to say, be cruel to be kind. Right. And because there's just some people that when you see some of the metrics and MCAT scores that are below 495, they're just not going to get through admissions committee. And I would like to have gotten my hands on them and say, you know, maybe save that, that money that you'd paid to check us off on AMCAS and then you paid to, you paid us on the secondary, this stuff adds up quickly. And yeah, just, does. I wish I could have gotten my hands and say, you know, hold off. If, well, if you have plans to retake the MCAT, do it again another time. Just, But you, I can tell you, this is not going to get through admissions committee. I mean, it's As you know, it's insanely competitive to apply to medical school. Right. So that's why we started that experiment. We piloted it last year to kind of see how it goes and how did it affect our application numbers? And it really didn't that much. And so that's something we're going to continue to look at. It's that cruel to be kind, I, I think. I think you are being kind. I yeah, think well, that's dominant is, is, is kindness there. Um, and, you know, I, I think you're forcing a certain realism. Yeah. And you because... are saving and you are saving applicants money and time and heartache and sweat. So I, yeah, yeah. I think it's more kindness than cruelty in there. Well, thank you for um, kind of give us a little validation from your perspective. And and it's not easy. And I, like I said, we might bump it up again this year. We we haven't met. We're going to be meeting as a committee in the next couple of months to evaluate it again. But it it is the numbers matter. I mean, yeah, we, we try to do holistic review, but at some point, there's got to be a little bit of a, a line of, do we think this is a student's going to be successful in a rigorous curriculum? Because med school is not easy wherever you no. go. Right. So we have a crystal ball we have to kind of look into, and that's the academic track record. And that's kind of what we have to go on when we're doing evaluations. You know, without I'm not criticizing other schools that don't have the, the cutoff, but you you have to wonder sometimes if if not having the cutoff like that, admittedly most students will look at the stats and they're not completely out to lunch in terms of their applications. But you have to wonder sometimes if they're not pumping up their numbers for selfish reasons by not having a cutoff. So yeah. again, I don't I'm not don't mean to be speaking badly of the other schools, but mm-hmm. I, I think there is a service being provided by giving that cutoff. Yeah, well, thank you. And we we had to talk about their finance department because they said, how much is, if we don't bring these in, how much right. it's, and they were like, eh, I guess, okay, that's, we get what you're trying to do. Go ahead and do it. Let's, and then we'll talk about it next spring and see what you want to do. Right. Mm-hmm. All right. Now you've mentioned how research is a component of all three programs at, at Case Western. Is prior research a, a, a must have or a nice to have? Mm-hmm. Uh, when applying to to case to any of the three programs, but okay. in particular the MD program, where like you say, it's thesis light or thesis yeah. on a diet or with yeah. saccharin, whatever you want to call yeah. it. <laughs> so I'll start with the university program, the four year MD. Right. And we state that research is not required to apply to the four year program. We define research though very broadly, and so we even have an essay in our secondary. Like, tell us about any research or scholarly work that you've done, and what'd you learn from it. And so, and we also put examples, this could be, 
an honors thesis that you did in undergrad or a capstone project. It doesn't have to be medically related or clinically related or basic science. It could be you did a capstone project in literature or in, in anthropology or something. So just to to show that you've done a, because I think in all those, you could, you could clearly say they applied the scientific method, the scientific principles, and just to kind of see what they took away from it. If somebody says, I have not done research, that's okay. We have programming within our curriculum to teach students how to start to get research teed up. So we have students that come to us every year who have not done formal research before. That said, though, I will say that in our matriculating class, when, it, when, the, when the kind of the melt all happens and we get down to it, about 90 to 95% of our incoming students have had some kind of research. And again, defined very broadly, honors right. thesis, capstone project, things like that. But there are students who haven't had it, and it's because they've had other things going on, which which was like maybe they're in athletics, or they were employed and working a lot, or they're a non-traditional student and didn't participate in research, but they've been doing a post back program. So there's always kind of other stories going on within the application that kind of tell us, oh, well, we don't go looking for research, but we see it if they have it, and if they don't, we go, oh, well, look at all the other cool stuff they were doing. So we kind of try to put that story together. When it comes to the learner program, the Cleveland Clinic program, and the MSTP, you clearly have to have the ethos of those programs is very baked in research. They value longitudinal research. And I, what I mean by longitudinal is more than like two summers of doing yeah. 10 weeks of summer research, like across an academic year or in a postgraduate situation where you're doing like maybe a year or two at the NIH or something at, at a hospital for a year or a year and a half. They need, they need to know that you're invested in this type of future lifestyle, that the academics behind it, that you are into the ethos of those programs. So they value- Is publication required for those programs? No, and that's a, that's a good question, Linda. I mean, because I have applicants, pre prospective applicants ask me all the time, you know, if I'm applying to MD, PhD, do I have to have publication? Or if I'm applying to the learner program? No, the answer is no, not necessarily. And I, the way I contextualize it is, what if you're in a lab that's doing a longitudinal study across years and you're plopping in and like you're three because you're junior or senior or something. And they're just not at the point where they're ready to publish anything, but yet you're working on a larger piece of that puzzle right now. That's going to contribute to the longitudinal work, but you're just not there. They're not there as a lab yeah. right now. We can't penalize you for that. That said, maybe the work that you do do in that lab can be turned into an abstract or a poster presentation when there's is some kind of results that you think are worthy of kind of showing people that. So there's that aspect, but we're not a school that, that is going through and saying they have X number of publications interview. And, and even so I know some of our scientists, if you have publications, they'll look into them. And cause sometimes people fluff their application with some, some publications that, you know, are just like, Oh, this is, this is really, you know, this was peer reviewed kind of thing. So there's, you can, it can sometimes not be to your advantage sometimes if it's just, you're just pumping out something just to say you have your name on a paper. Yeah. Does that yeah. make sense? Yes. It does. It makes a lot of sense. Um, for sure. Somebody published on a blog. There's no, there's no peer review, right? Yeah. Uh, there's no, no, you know, yeah. passing muster of, of any kind. Now, mm -hmm. one of the things I've noticed with applicants is they seem to be very focused. Well, we've talked about how numbers, can count and and can't count. A lot of times applicants say, I have so many hours of shadowing, is that enough? I have so many hours of clinical experience, is that enough? If I have so many hours of non-clinical volunteering, is that enough? So let's let's start first with shadowing. Is shadowing required to apply to Case Western? And if so, how much is required? And what about virtual shadowing? Okay, so we do not overtly say Shadowing is required, but I think it's written down there. It says strongly recommended. Okay. And a lot of med schools are in that in that camp, I think. Because the simple matter is we need to know that you know what you're getting yourself into. That's what it boils down to in a way. And so so while it's strongly recommended, we don't have a certain number of hours that we're looking for, but it comes down to quality not quantity. That said though, a little bit of nuance here. It should be more than like eight hours, you know, yeah. more than a working day to really spend some time with people 
and maybe it's a cup of few physicians to kind of see medicine through different lenses, whether it's pediatrics and oncology and cardiology, to really see a, a little bit of a scope of what the practice lifestyle profession looks like. It should be a little more than like, you know, the teens, I think, to really bend and be able to, because then this will come out in an interview situation. Are they able to articulate some of the reflections and insights they gain from being in those clinics or in those situations or rubbing elbows with physicians, that's where it's going to come out, whether it was quality or quantity. And serendipitously or coincidentally, yesterday I was working on some data that some people were asking me for. And in the last la entering class last year, the average number of shadowing hours for our entering class was 126. Wow. And that's the year lot. prior to that, yeah, the year prior to that, 2022, was it was also 126. Hmm. I'll be darned. Um, so that was shadowing hours, and then like medically related. So whether that's like paid employment, medically related, like scribing is like the new cottage industry for pre medical students. It's great. Right. You know, to get paid to be in the emergency department, working with physicians, nurses, and all the staff, and being in the room and behind the curtain with patients and seeing all that stuff. That's amazing. What a great opportunity. And so I looked at that, those numbers, and we had the average number is 1,516 hours of paid and medically related employment. Wow, that's a lot. Yeah. Yeah. Medically related volunteer came in at 376 hours. So people, I mean, it, I think this that's who matriculated with us. So it's an average across 170. And we're not looking in for certain numbers that were like hit this average or below the average. I this is not data that we give to our screeners to like, you know, benchmark people. Right. But I think it goes to show that our admissions committee values rich experiences, whether it's shadowing, medically related things, paid employment, or volunteering. I think that is demonstrating that our committee looks very closely at quality experiences. And then clearly the students were able to articulate their observations and their understanding of what this profession means. I was smiling when you, when you mentioned quality, because I sometimes get questions. I have, as I, as I mentioned earlier, I have X hours of this, Y hours of that, Z hours of that. Mm -hmm. I have this MCAT and I have that GPA. It's all competitive. Why didn't I get accepted? Mm -hmm. we, we get a lot of reapplicants coming to us. Sure. And, and I'll say, well, how did you present it? Did you, did you bring your insights to it? Did you talk about what you learned? Did you talk about how you contributed? Did you talk about how you grew from the experience? Mm -hmm. And they're like, um, I don't know. Mm -hmm. <laughs> and of course, then the next question is, do I have to rewrite my stuff? And I'm, and I usually, usually you usually respond. Yeah. I said, well, it didn't mm -hmm. work last time. Why do you think it's going to work this time? Right. Don't slap the same thing out there next time. Right. But I, I think that clearly you, I think, I think case Western has pretty high numbers in terms of the shadowing, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera, and clinical and all, and all that. But I'm, mm -hmm. I'm so glad that you also talked about the qualitative aspect. Cause I think that that's so underestimated, even though I asked about, about quantity, mm -hmm. the other question I'd have for you and, and, you know, the average numbers that you, that you cited to my, to my knowledge are, are pretty high. So clearly Case Western emphasizes that and values it a lot, but let's say somebody was a scribe and a scribe in different specialties. Mm -hmm. Are you still going to want to see shadowing? I mean, the fact that maybe they were an EMT or probably a scribe. No, yeah. I mean, not. no, no, because that's the other stuff they did. Yeah. Another thing that I've said uh, many times is that shadowing is a great way to start exploring clinical medicine. Mm -hmm. It's a terrible way to end it. Yeah. It's not would, if, I could, if I could add something to that. Sure, too. please. Uh, so, you, you, I, I want to come back to, you asked me about virtual shadowing. I want to come back yeah. to that too. Well, I want to mention too, you just mentioned, uh, what if somebody was a scribe, let's say an emergency department. Yeah. And they were also an EMT. Mm -hmm. Now, I think we could argue or admissions committees could argue their scope or lens is very narrow exactly. on what medicine could look like because right. it's at the, the pre-hospital and emergency stage. 
And it's, it's they, also a very short-term relationships. Yep. I mean, we're in and out kind of thing. And so not that there's, I'm not devaluing it, but I think if an applicant has that profile, they may want to complement it with, if you're working in an emergency department, you have access, you have a built-in network. Talk to people, say, hey, uh, when cardiology right. comes down for the consult, neurology is being called down for a consult get introduced or introduce yourself. Say, hey, you know, can I sometimes hang out with you guys? You know, like that kind of, I'm pre-med, blah, 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 blah. So you take advantage of that. But I think what somebody could argue, like maybe their view is very narrow what medicine really looks like if it's just pre-hospital to emergency. Wouldn't it be nice to kind of complement it with something else, pediatrics, neurology, we'll add one in whatever else you want to, might be interested in or have uh, curiosity about. Um, but that might add a little extra color then to the application right. and be able to then kind of round out what that view can look like. And then again, being able to articulate that in an interview situation. I want to come back to virtual shadowing you asked me about. Sure. I feel like, Linda, we're seeing as, as we get farther away from the pandemic students, applicants, we're seeing less and less of that. And I... I don't really have a, we haven't really talked about it as a team. Like, are we taking this or not? Because people had on their application. Usually now we're getting to the point where people have virtual shadowing maybe from 2022 or 2021. And since then they've done other medically related activities. It was in the early stages, like 2021, 2020, where we're like a little more of the virtual shadowing than we were, than we were ever seeing because it really wasn't a thing prior to 2020. Right. Now I think I think we're seeing kind of the back end of that and getting back to what traditional quote unquote uh, shadowing phys- or you know medical related uh, experiences can look like. Great, great answer. Thank you very much, and I'm I'm glad you pointed out the the narrowest of the example that I gave. Let's turn to the application itself. We've talked in general terms about some ex- experiential requirements and non requirements. Mm-hmm. When you look at the secondary application specifically, what are you trying to glean from it that you don't get from the primary? Well, um, as you know, the primary has one main personal statement, which is kind of the, the the main, like, tell us why you're here. Why are you applying to medical school? Why are you interested in medicine? So we, we're getting that viewpoint. There are things in our secondary essays that we're trying to drill a little bit more down on. And at the end, you know, overall, what we're looking for is our additional evidence of reflection, insight, the ability to self-reflect. Maybe we might be able to tap into a little bit of emotional intelligence, social intelligence, through some evidence that they might be sharing with us within their responses. And also, we have some other questions like, is there anything else you'd like to share with us? Here's a here's an optional essay. Is there anything else that wasn't captured anywhere in your application up to this point or something new? So that could be, we see all kinds of stuff in there. Um, people write all kinds of things. Um, and then we ask a question, like if you're doing a gap year, tell us what you've been doing. Because some, that's not captured in the primary. That, that, that may not be captured clearly in the primary. So right. we get some insight there. But I think, Linda, an overarching kind of theme of what we're looking for is more insight, more evidence of self-reflection, maturity, backstory, like maybe other things that couldn't be captured in the primary, like some of of their backstory or like challenges they faced or overcome and things like that. So um, it's it's kind of a um, a broad range of, but where it's it helps us though, then try to see when we're doing the interview. Is the person we're meeting in the interview the same person we met in the essays? Right. And a lot of times there's correlation there. It's interesting. You ever wonder if maybe there's some growth that's taken place between the time they submitted the application and uh, maturation? Because because they're you know you submit the primary maybe in June and you the secondary in July or August and then you interview in February or March. Yeah, it could have grown a bit. Younger, it could be a a positive thing, not just negative. Mm -hmm. Um. Obviously, if, you know, they can't put a sentence together in person and the essays are beautifully written and articulate, you you might wonder about something else going right. on. But sometimes it can be growth, mm-hmm. especially mm-hmm. if they're doing a, a lot of interesting things. Mm-hmm. Now, Case Western has four cornerstones or themes in its curriculum, at least per the website. Research and scholarship, which we've touched on. Mm-hmm. Clinical mastery, which I think you also touched on in terms of the small group learning. Mm-hmm. 
And then there's leadership and civic professionalism. How do successful applicants sh show that they share those values in uh, via their application? Truth be told, our essays, our essay prompts aren't written in a way that we're looking for students to write themselves into that kind of those pillars that you just mentioned. You're, you're looking for them to do it or you're not looking? We're for not. Them? Our, our yeah. prompts are not written so mm -hmm. such that we're looking for people to say, oh, this is, they want, re they look at leadership. I'm going to write right. all about leadership. It's, we're not evaluating that way. Okay. Um, it, and it's, so it's very, it, it's broadly defined and we want people to, we hope the applicants that we're interested in are writing authentically about things that they, they've they done, they've experienced, they've enjoyed, they've grown from, not in a way that's like, true, and honestly, we're not a mission-driven admissions office okay. in respect of, because I'm like my friend, um, Layla Harrison at Washington State University, very mission-driven medical school. Right. Spokane, they're there about bringing, you know, students from Washington, staying in Washington, serving the residents of Washington state. We're a little different than that. And, and so I think that, you know, we're talking about creating a new uh, value statement or mission statement for our medical education division that would then mm -hmm. tie in admissions all the way through student affairs to graduation and the curriculum kind of thing. But our, our essay prompts are not written so that we're looking for certain, are they check all these boxes off in our four little pillars? And that's that's our approach right now. Does okay, great. Yeah, it helps a lot. So then what makes an applicant jump off the page for you? Oh, if it's I, not mission yeah. fit, what does it? I almost went there when you were asking me a few minutes ago uh, about <laughs> essay prompts. And, and I was just at a fair uh, at, University of Michigan a week ago. And mm -hmm. I got that question. I can't tell you how many times. How sure. do you, how do I, and it's a really common question. And I, I get it. People want to know, like, what makes somebody stand out in this pool of applicants? And they're all really, you know, for the most part, most applicants applying to med school are stars. They're impressive and, people. Yeah. And so what the people are fascinated to know, like, what makes somebody be seen? And I'll tell you what, I think it's the way people write. It's the way you write about things. And you mentioned it before when you're talking about talking, meeting with reapplicants. And they say, Linda, I've got this, this, and this. I've got all these great things. Why didn't I get an interview? And it might be the and you're like, well, what did you how did you write about it? <laughs> yeah. And and this is where I think if an applicant is taking their time and they need to understand if you're just getting into this process, there are 15 experiences slots, if you will. And each one of them, you're essentially going to have to write many essays for each one. They give you 750 characters. And then of those 15, if you do 15, you don't have to, I don't think you have to do all 15, but you get to choose three of them to share more. Like, why was this most meaningful? Why was this most influential? And they give you like 1,300 more characters. So you're writing essays for a lot of these. And that's a place where you can do a little storytelling or talk about you know, how this challenged you and how you grew from it or how you're still growing. That You know what? You're not perfect. And that's okay to say, yeah, I had this challenged me and I'm still working on it. Like this has been hard, but it's, it's pushing me. It's pushed me. And I think that's where, and some students are really good at finding their writing voice. And there's sometimes, Linda, when I'm reading these applications, Gosh, you feel like you're you're having you're hearing a conversation from somebody. Somebody is telling you about themselves in a way they write. It's just it's enjoyable to read. I get another common question. I guess like, what's the best application you've ever read? And I've read like thousands of these. I've been here yeah. for almost nineteen years, man. Like I can't remember everything, but the, I do. You remember the feelings of being like, whoa, that was really well written. And then when I interview somebody and I read their application to prep for it, and I really like to write, I'll tell them in the first five minutes I've met them, I have to tell you, you wrote an amazing application. I enjoyed reading it. And I tell them that because I know how much time that went into that. Yeah. And I think they need to hear that somebody appreciated their work and enjoyed the way they wrote because I know it put a, they put a lot of effort into it. And that should, you should acknowledge that to them. 
And I do. I like doing that. People are usually very flattered and stunned, I think, at first. But well, they do put a lot of effort into yeah. it. There's no question. It takes a lot no of time question. to do AMCAS. It does. And then the secondary also. And of course, yeah. there's multiple secondaries. Nobody applies. Nobody oh should apply gosh. to one medical school. Right. Um, so, yeah. Because I would, I would say to Linda, if I could tack onto that, you know, there's, and sometimes I do this when I give talks to pre-medical students, like, all right, because people ask, what, how do you stand down? Like, okay, in the group, who's done shadowing? Raise your hand. Whole room, raise your hand. Who's done a little bit of research? Raise your hand. Who's volunteered? Raise your hand. How about tutoring? Raise your hand. I mean, there's a, there's kind of a profile and that's okay of a pre-medical student. There are certain things you're doing to explore to get here. So everybody that might have a similar profile, then how do you stand out? You get specific. You come down to the writing. How will you share what you've done in these things? And that's what will then could could really, you know, pop. What I've done, just to, to add to what you said, and I think I, I also would sometimes give a presentation and say, how many of you have volunteered? You know, hands mm -hmm. go up. How many of you have shouted? Hands go up. How many of you have research? Hands go up. And then I'll say, okay, how many of you have volunteered in a pediatric hematology oncology playroom? How many of you have worked at a soup kitchen in a particular neighborhood of Chicago? I'm from mm -hmm. Los Angeles. How many of you have, I, I start getting much more specific and suddenly you either have no hands going up or one hand going up. And then if they add their insights to that mm -hmm. specific experience, you have a whole, you have an individual. Mm -hmm. You're drilling so down. You're drilling down. And that's, that's how they individuate. Now they still can tell a story well, they can tell it poorly, but in terms of, of differentiation, individuation, it's the specifics yep. that make the difference. Mm -hmm. And you yep. could, you, you could, if, if I was in person, you could just see the eyes getting big when it's like, oh yeah, you know, uh -huh. Uh -huh. Uh, but um I think that's, you know, you've given some wonderful perspective on the, on the essays and what makes for outstanding essays. What makes for a great interview? Interviewing can be an art. It's not easy. It's not easy. It can, it, it can be difficult for some people. If one, it's hard. Sometimes people, a lot of people aren't used to talking about themselves. Yeah. Some people just, it's just, that's not in their nature. And so I think that is something first to become comfortable with. And that comes from a little bit of practice, a little bit of practice because somebody's you're the applicant should be prepared to talk about 75% of the time. So that's a lot of talking on their end. And I think what makes for a good interview is if it feels conversational versus Q and a, you know, question, answer, question, answer, grilling. And I hope that, I mean, when we are training our interviewers, that's one of the things we try to emphasize to them. We're trying to get to know the person on the other end of Zoom here, not to grill them. They're already going to be nervous. <laughs> this is high stakes stuff. So we were trying to meet their authentic self of who's showing up today, not create a big stress bag out of them and try to test them. And, and that's not our purpose here. So we try to train our interviewers to make the questions that we have conversational. And so hopefully that sets the stage so that the applicant can settle in a little bit and then start to have a, a, what should feel like conversational, but also having that ability to share insights, share some more of those reflections. So that there's substantive responses. That's what makes for a good interview. Also, when I can learn something about them that I didn't read in their application. Right. There are some times when I'm interviewing a candidate and the stories that they tell and share are interesting, but it's the same stuff I read in their application. And so sometimes you leave the interview feeling like, okay, well, I met them and they were really nice and they communicated well, but they, I already, I didn't learn any new stories or anything I knew about them because they, they, they shared the same things they read in their app, they shared in their application. So if somebody can compliment and add into some special sauce into their interview, share something new about themselves that I don't already know and somehow infuse it in with some different storytelling, then that's makes yeah. for an interesting interview. 
It also shows them as dynamic, growing human beings. I have more stories to tell, not just those three that were in my application. <gasps> right. Right. Oh, that's a great hit. Great tip. Thank yeah. you. Do you have any plans to require a situational judgment test? You know, we dabbled with it a couple years ago and we, we dabbled with Casper. Man, it was about three years ago now. And um, we didn't get out of it what I thought what we thought we were looking for in it. So we decided to pause on it. And then we looked closely at the AAMC's uh, SJT preview. And again, we kind of we we've paused on that too. Now, both myself and Dr. Maida, my dean, have been involved in the testing and creation of preview mm -hmm. as content experts. It was really interesting. And I think they have a, a good approach. I like the questions they ask and things, but we're still trying to, if we're going to make an applicant do it, I think one thing we learned is that if we're going to make an applicant go through that process, we need to be able to tie it to something within our admissions process, whether it's tying mm -hmm. it to something within our curriculum where we have something where we can measure like, oh, somebody has this kind of preview score and it means something in our curriculum here. We want to be able to you know, have something measurable. So we're not, because it's not free. Right. And it, it takes students time to do this. So we don't just want to, and if we're going to ask a student, an applicant to do this, we want to make it meaningful. Not right. just a, oh, we're just going to look at it. Maybe we'll look at it. Maybe we won't look at it. I don't know. We want to make sure like we're tying something to it so that it has purpose. Right. So Makes not sense. right now. Yeah. So we're, we're, we're still haven't gone down that back down that road yet. What is Case Western's position in terms of updates at different points in the application mm -hmm. process? Some schools. Yeah encourage updates, some schools only after interview, some only if waitlisted. What's yeah. Case Western's position? Uh, it's kind of program specific. Um, okay. And MSTP, they they will accept updates. And and I think it's important for the, that, that applicant cohort because sometimes they have research updates that are coming in throughout the application cycle that they want to share. That makes sense. For the university program in our Cleveland Clinic, Learner College of Medicine, we do not accept updates at the time of application or during the application process, unless you're invited for an interview. And the reason why is, look, MSTP, they get like 400 applications. University program, we got close to 7,800 applications last year. College program got about 2,000 applications. When you open, I worry that if we open that door to like, hey, send us updates. I mean, it already takes a long time to screen these applications. I know applicants are sometimes like, I've been, been complete since July 16th and I haven't heard from you. Like, do you remember how much time it took for you to put that application together? It takes us a long time to read them. <laughs> so you want us to take our time and being thorough and read these thoughtfully. I worry that if we open the gates of like, send us updates, and then people are updating, uploading all kinds of stuff into the application, that's going to slow down our screening process. The application is already provides enough breadth and depth for us to render a decision. I don't need that one more letter of recommendation. I don't need that one more update that you got an A in a class or you got a poster or something. You've you've given us so much, like almost your entire academic and personal life history and secondary applications and three or five letters of recommendation to render a decision, we're good. But at the, after you've been invited to interview, then you are we allow students to send us updates and but, throughout then the rest of the process, whether they're waitlisted or you know, so we will take updates after that for the university so, program. The, so it's day. even if they've been once they've been invited to interview, they don't have to have interviewed. Okay. Right. All right, right. great. Yeah, invited Thank you. They, the the button becomes available. What advice do you have for the applicant who is currently waitlisted at Case Western? Mm -hmm. I assume there are a few of them at this point in time. Yeah, sure. So uh, what advice would you have for them? We're a school that um, likes to hear people from people. Stay in touch okay. with us. We send periodic emails out to our waitlist candidates, just kind of checking in, saying, "Hey, like, um, if you're still interested, you know, do you have the opportunity to share with us that information? If anything new has come up that you want to tell us about, because when we get to the point where uh, at the end of April, beginning of May, when we're looking at it, watching our our class kind of come together, and we, if we dip below." our class target, which we've done every year since I've been here, we always go to our alternate list, our wait list. Uh, we want to be thoughtful on who we're contacting. Sure. And so 
because we don't just shotgun out, you know, a bunch of acceptances and kind of wait and see who's it, you know, who we hear back from, because these are now where the point where it's one to one. Right. And so we can't, we don't want to get then above our target. So we want to be one to one. And so having, if somebody has been in touch with us and they've expressed interest and that kind of thing, well, then that could, now we don't rank our, our, our alternate list. Um, but we have there, I don't want to get too deep in the weeds and how it works, but anyway, we have some flexibility from our admissions committee and to whom we can look at for our, for our alternate list. But, um, but yeah, having that staying in touch with us is, is great. It's invited. Right. Okay. All right. Understood. Thank you. Mm -hmm. Now, the opening up of AMCAS is a few weeks away, and the beginning of the next application cycle is looming. This will this show will air in April. Mm. What words of wisdom do you have for applicants planning to apply in this upcoming cycle? Okay. First one. Yeah. Go this for came it. Up, yeah. This came up last week. I said it was at, I was at Michigan, University of Michigan. Somebody said, well, I plan on submitting on the first day in June when it's available. And I said, Okay. Hang on a second. Just so you know, when the submit button becomes available on whatever it's June 2nd or something whatever like that, is, yeah. nobody gets a gold star. If you submit at 12.01 on June 2nd to med school, I mean, you can post it on Instagram or whatever, <laughs> but nobody gets a gold star for that because here's what happens. You can submit it on June 1st or June 2nd. And if it, then there's a verification process timeline. So AMCAS has got to verify all the transcripts that you send to them and match it up with the grades that you put in. That could take three or four weeks, sometimes two to four weeks. But even if you're verified within three weeks, we're not going to get your application until the end of June anyway. There is a date like June 29th when the when any verified application has been targeted to your school will be dropped into our database then. So there's no advantage in my mind, to like be to rush to get your application submitted at twelve oh one, because then you can say you did it. But maybe the quality of it might have been rushed, so that you could just do it and say that you submitted on the very first day. It's going to sit there for three and a half, four weeks. So my advice to people is submit when you feel like it is tip top shape. It is sparkling. You've polished it, and it is the best thing you could put in front of people. Whether that's on June 2nd or June 11th or June 15th, I think if we're getting a little deeper in the summer, like if we're getting into August, September-ish, that's getting late for me. Right. Because then it's getting secondary turned around and stuff. I mean, it's it, it's getting a little late for me, my comfortable level in the application process. But look, if you're applying on you know June 21st or something, I, I just feel like you know, that's when you feel ready to click submit. And it, you're just like mm, chef's kiss, then that's when you should do it. That right. would be my number one tip for people. Rush mediocrity doesn't do it. Oh, it drives me nuts. So just before you click submit, whenever that is, go through that application with a fine tooth comb, looking for grammar mistakes, looking for uh, misspellings, because we will scrutinize these things. And a poorly, well, you could have the most amazing, I think, experiences to share with people. But if it's poorly written and it has grammatical errors and miss and poor punctuation and misspellings, it people are going to be like, this is sloppy. Is this their best work? Right. I, I don't know about you, Linda, but I want a detail oriented physician. <laughs> yeah. Details matter. Yeah. And so that is, this is what you're presenting to people. Is this your best work? And it has, it's sloppy. I don't think so. So that, that may be something to really think about. Have other people read it, run it through all kinds of grammar checks. I mean, I can't tell you how many. But evaluate the grammar check. Yeah. Don't, yeah. Don't look blindly at or, yes. Yeah. Or read AI. It out loud. Read it out loud. Do, do yeah. all the scans, checks, things that you can think of. Have other people read it looking for things. You want this to be just your best work. So you're really putting your best self out there. So that would be my big tip. Sounds great. Tell us about your podcast, All Access Med School Admissions Podcast. It's a great podcast. Oh, thank you. My podcast, I wish I had more time to do it. 
Um, this admission stuff kind of gets in the way sometimes. Um, <laughs> Your other wish, career? <laughs> yeah, I know. And so it's really become kind of a hobby, but I do get a little time to work on it, but I wish I had more time. So I, it's been awesome. I, I get to meet some amazing people. I've made new friends across the country and to hear them open up about their school. And then I hear from now, I've been doing it for five years now. And now it's kind of crazy that I've had applicants who were like, I started listening to this 2019 and now I'm, I'm coming to med school. They listened for four years, five years. It kind of blows me away. It kind of freaks me out a little bit too. Like it's <laughs> like, it's pretty wild. Um, you probably get the same kind of responses too, but it, it really is um, heartwarming to hear from people that they said it helped them in some way, or, or it, it brought a school on their radar that would have never thought about before. And they decided to apply to it and they end up going there. Um, it really has gone beyond what I ever kind of expected it would to go in, you know, with the direction and, and the amount of people that listen to it, it really, I've never, I've not gotten used to that, um, that kind of thing. And, and so, uh, I hope to get more time this, this year, 2024, I've been in grad school and business school since last year and January last year. So I'm graduating in May. Oh, congratulations. And thank you. And, but that's kind of eaten up my, I've had to put up a lot of boundaries on like outside, like non-work mm -hmm. things or just like, cause I'm always doing homework or working on a paper. And I, so usually I do podcasty stuff on my weekends or sitting on the couch at night and I haven't had that kind of time. So I'm looking forward to getting kind of back on the podcast horse. I got a couple ideas brewing for some future things, but it's just working in the time. But uh, thank you for asking. I, I, it really is an enjoyable, yeah, some it, excellent in interviews there. Oh, thank you. And it's been fun to learn a new, it's been like, a, I've, I try to feel like I have a growth mindset and to teach myself and learn how to do this stuff, how to do audio editing and, and, uh, you know, how to make it all work and stuff like that and find music and make it sound cool. <laughs> I like that kind of stuff. So I'm kind of nerdy like that. I, I like the talking to people part. The technical stuff I leave to others, but uh, <laughs> the talking to people is great. And I, and I agree with you, you know, having applicants say that they found the podcast helpful or sometimes having schools say, oh, you yeah. know, I talk to admissions directors and they say, you know, I, I heard from interviewees that they listened to my podcast and they found it really, really yep. helpful. And then they're very happy to come back on a second time, which yeah. is great as far as I'm concerned. Yeah, I've gotten so. the same comments from my friends. That they say, oh my God, we met the student. And they said they applied to me because you're thing i'm like yeah well you're welcome it was fun yeah yeah fun. for sure yeah. Yeah. what would you have liked me to ask you you know what comes to mind linda is what's the culture here at case western go for it what's the culture at case western oh i'm glad you asked <laughs> um because that's something that i think is you can't i worry sometimes about writing that on a website about what the culture is, because maybe it might come across as contrived or it's like, this is just a shiny website and it's just, they're just saying this. Um, but I really, that's one thing that I, we're continuing to do interviews virtually for a number of reasons. And it comes down to logistics for our, locally for our interviewers to not have to come to campus and find parking, that stuff, but also financially for applicants, they're saving tons sure. of money and, and not having to travel around the country. But I, there's one trade-off that I miss, and that is the interview day energy, and our applicants are not kind of getting to feel like a what a natural what a regular day is like here, seeing current students in their live medical students in the wild doing their thing in their learning environments, and kind of feeling that energy and that culture, seeing the students smiling and laughing, and looks like they have a good time and they're friends and stuff. So we're missing that piece, and. So when applicants ask me, like, what's the culture like there? I mean, I, I'm excited to kind of tell them because they're maybe missing that until they come for maybe an admitted student day kind of thing. But it's, I think people are pleasantly surprised to kind of hear, like, it's kind of laid back here. I mean, they work hard. I mean, it's med school. Like, they're still working right. hard. Right. But Pete, our students are, I think I've heard from prospective students coming to us, like, I can't believe how happy your students are. And they seem balanced. Like... And I think it's a way of, because our curriculum is structured in a way such that it's not eight to five every day. And in working in these small, intimate learning environments, you get to know people well. You're going to see people on good days and some not so good days. 
when they got something going on, you know, at home or something like that. And so you become kind of a, a tight knit group, or at least you become invested in one another a little bit more. I'm not going to go to as far as say everybody's best friends and they hold hands and skip and sing in the hallways, but they get to know each other pretty well. And I think that comes down to relationships and, um, you know, having a vested interest in one another's success. And so there's, I think people here are like down earth, kind, cool, interesting, polite, and the culture here really kind of starts at our vice dean's level. And she has kind of, it, cultures come from behaviors. And it's the way you behave, I think, that kind of sets our culture. And that is kind of what you see here is, is what we, um, it's it's real. It's not It's not phony. And so I think you can come here and feel like you belong. People are going to welcome you. And it's, it's genuine. That's wonderful. So I hope that illustrates a little bit of what it's like to be here. It does. And I want to thank you for uh, having me ask that question. Yeah, it's a great you. one to end the, end the interview with. This has been enlightening. It's been fantastic and delightful, but I think I'm going to control myself and bring it to a close. Where can listeners learn more about Case Western Reserves University's College of Medicine? Yeah. Well, I think you can go to your favorite uh, search engine, search Case Western School of Medicine, and you'll find us. It's like case.edu slash medicine. And uh, you can find us there, dig deep. Um, and then find us on, like, like you said, my podcast. We have a couple podcast episodes about our school specifically, but um, you can check that out too. So thank you for asking and giving me, giving me the opportunity to share a little bit about who we are and what we have to offer. My pleasure. We're going to include links in the show notes at exhibit.com slash 571 to the Case Western Medical site, as well as to Christian's All Access podcast. Listener, thank you too for joining us for our 571st episode. If you find the show worthwhile, please subscribe. Make sure you don't miss any future shows, be they with deans, admissions directors, professors, current students, test prep pros, or alumni doing great things. And last reminder, take the Med School Admissions Quiz. See if you are ready to apply and learn what you need to do to improve your chances of acceptance. Take the quiz today at accepted.com slash med quiz. That's M-E-D-Q-U-I-Z. This is Admissions Straight Talk produced by Accepted and I am your host, Linda Abraham. I'll talk to you again next week.